Our next speaker is uh, Mark Vickers, who is Associate Professor and Senior Research Fellow at the Ling Liggins Institute in the University of Auckland in New Zealand. His research focuses on the effects of alterations of early life nutrition on later health and well-being of offspring, with particular focus on the development of obesity and metabolic syndrome. Dr. Vickers will speak on therapies to reverse metabolic disturbances arising as a consequence of developmental programming. Great to have you. And thanks for the invitation to be here. I've left summer to come to snow. I mean, according to the timetable, I've got five minutes to give my talk. But um, luckily, the last three speakers have actually given a good overview of some of my slides. There's a bit of repetition, so when necessary, I'll, I'll just go over that part. So we all know, from what we've heard all day today, that what happens in early life in terms of nutritional exposures in particular will lead to an increased risk for a range of metabolic disorders in later life obesity, heart disease, and so forth. Um, it's obviously not a single cause, but a complex multifactorial process. And while we are getting some grips around some of the mechanisms um, associated with such programming, there's still very much known about interventions early in life to diminish the incidence and severity of later disease. And more importantly, the intervention studies that have been undertaken in animals have been very slow to translate to any degree at all into the clinical setting. And some of that is around safety issues, which I'll go through in a bit. Um, so most evidence to date is actually derived from experimental models with limited translation. So what are the interventions? I mean, there's a range of dietary interventions, lipids, pre-probiotics, uh, taurine as an essential amino acid, uh, vitamins, uh, polyphenols, uh, methyl donors, for example, some of the stuff that Rob talked about and so forth today. Um, some pharmacologic strategies, uh, a lot of work on leptin we just heard about, growth hormone, there's some work on melatonin, GLP-1 analogs such as Xendin-4, which Becky Simmons and some of her group has done, and some nuclear receptor agonists as well. Obviously, there's behavioral lifestyle, and if, if efficacy in those interventions was greater than it is, that would be the ideal option, because that's the easiest to um, implement with any, without any real safety issues, as these two may have. Um, that includes exercise, dietary counseling, and so forth. And also, on top of this, how do we intervene, and also when to intervene? The programming window of plasticity is actually a very difficult window to get the timing right, especially across species as well. How do you translate the rodent model? Neonatal interventions in the rodent translate to late gestation in a human. Then you go to the sheep. Where does that fit in this picture as well? Um, your preconception, pregnancy, lactation, early infants and childhood, or combinations of some of these windows. I mean, obviously, some of the data to date suggests that maybe preconception is the best window to intervene. But unfortunately, in places like New Zealand, in some areas, 60 to 70 percent of all pregnancies are unplanned, especially in some of the higher risk groups that you actually want to target the most. So that window almost becomes lost in a lot of circumstances. Um, this is a, a graph from uh, Keith Godfrey's group, basically showing how plasticity diminishes over time. So the earlier the intervention, the better the effect later in life. So the earlier we can actually intervene while the, the, the individual is more malleable, more plastic, the better we can do. So we've got our genotype, our environment feeding in, we are plastic during these critical windows, and that ultimately leads to our adult phenotype. And we already touched on this today. It's very much a U-shaped curve. When the original programming work was undertaken in models of undernutrition, fetal growth restriction, but obviously in our setting, it's more important to look at overnutrition and obesity. But we almost need, also need to keep in mind that in many cases of obesity and overnutrition, it actually reflects micronutrient malnutrition as well. So many obese individuals are actually being malnourished. And the similarity in phenotype may be due to malnutrition at both ends of the spectrum. So we have to keep that in mind as well. So I'm going to talk about some of the intervention studies that I've done and some of the um, other key findings of others. But what's reassuring is that in a, in a range of animal models, whether it's sheep, non-human primate, piglet, mouse, guinea pig, a lot of the interventions seem to have similar phenotypic outcomes in terms of efficacy in reversing the phenotype. For example, some of the leptin work, which was originally undertaken in, in the rat, has now been undertaken in the piglet, and it's been undertaken in, in several strains of rats and mice as well, with very uniform responses. So that's quite reassuring that you're actually targeting something that, that may actually be meaningful. And uh, Karen sort of touched on this in her graph as well, so I'll, um, figures as well, so I'll go over it uh, quickly. I mean, there's a range of interventions. We can undernourish, we can add high fat, high salt, low protein, 
One thing which is quite overlooked at the moment is the impact of high fructose intake during pregnancy. There's very little literature about the effect of soda intake, for example, during pregnancy. We've done studies showing that as, as little as two cans of soda a day during pregnancy can rewire the arcuate nucleus and program leptin resistance in the offspring, independent of any change in maternal body weight or body composition. So fructose in pregnancy is actually very, very bad as well. And obviously, we can join some of these factors together as well. But also, as Karen alluded to, despite a range of models, a range of manipulations, we see a very common phenotype of metabolic syndrome type features, obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, altered appetite, inflammation, and reproductive disorders. So, for example, here in a model of fetal growth restriction, where it's quite easy to induce um, FGR in the rodent, they end up here, basically. And these guys are on the same diet postnatally. So, so very similar to what Kevin was showing before. Independent of a postnatal dietary challenge, you can still induce a, a very powerful phenotype. And if you add a high-fat diet to them, they just get worse on top of that. So what are the interventions? We're going to hear a bit about leptin, because that was one of the first interventions, and that stemmed from the work of Sebastian Bure, that we just heard about as well. There's more and more work coming out on exercise, particularly in the rodent models. The clinical interventions using exercise, once again, the, the outcomes are dependent on the type of exercise, the duration, that um, women use, whether they're normal pregnancies, high-fat pregnancies, and so forth. Um, there's dietary counseling and manipulation of the growth hormone IGF-1 axis as well is coming into play. And there's also a few vitamin type studies um, and methyl donor um, supplementation studies as well. So I won't go over this in too much detail because we've just heard about this in the, in the previous talk. But basically, the original work by Sebastian Bure showed that in the OBOB mouse, which was leptin deficient, if you replace leptin during a critical window of plasticity, and this was a neonatal period, the first two weeks of life, you could restore these projections in the arcuate, and these animals became essentially normal. But post-weaning treatment had no effect whatsoever. We took this idea and did a very similar thing in our outbred rats. So we used the same critical window in the rat and out using a model of maternal undernutrition. And what happened is the offspring of mothers that were undernourished, when fed a high-fat diet, just got fatter and fatter and fatter over time. If we gave them leptin for two weeks during the neonatal development, they became control animals. And importantly, in this study, the effects were specific to those animals that were born to undernourished mothers, and leptin had very little effect whatsoever in the control line. And I've said this has been now been repeated in quite a few other studies. And we've also got evidence to support the work of Beret showing we've actually reprogrammed or rewired parts of the um, arcuate nucleus as well. And importantly, leptin is present in breast milk, as we heard some uh, data on before this morning, but it's not an infant formula. So when some of our data came out, there was this big rush about why don't we just add leptin into infant formula? And this was in the UK, and they were actually quite serious about it at the time. But we know from the studies we've done past this that we know the effects of leptin are actually dependent upon prior nutritional status of the mother, so they had to be compromised, basically. And also, there are quite marked sex-specific effects. A lot of studies in this field don't look at the effect of sex in their outcomes. They choose one over the other. Males are better because we get a phenotype, so we don't do the females. But it's very important to look at both when doing these kind of studies. And we also know the data I showed you before is leptin treatment to females. We also know that leptin treatment to males using the same paradigm can, in, under the setting of normal pregnancies, can actually elicit an adverse outcome in these offspring. So male offspring of normal pregnancies treated with leptin can become insulin resistant, for, uh, for example. So you have to be very careful who you target for intervention. And we also see this bifurcation in, 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 um, in the outcomes of leptin treatment. Um, this is 11 beta HSD2, um, uh, PPR alpha here. As you can see, leptin treatment to offspring of control pregnancy, she's a shift that way. We see a completely opposite shift in those animals that are born to undernourished mothers given leptin. So we see a completely opposing response based on the prior nutritional background of the mother. Um, there's also uh, some work by um, Stocker over in Buckinghamshire in the UK. They also did some maternal leptin treatment, and they saw a reduction in placental 11 beta hsd 2 activity in low-protein-fed mothers, and they saw a partial restoration of this activity in those mothers that were given leptin. Unfortunately, in this group, there was no control group given leptin because it would have been quite interesting to see what that did, given the data we had from our previous study showing potentially adverse effects in a normally replete pregnancy as well. 
Um, some nice work from uh, Becky Simmons and colleagues. Um, they also use a very critical window. This is the first two weeks of life in, in, the, in the rat or the mouse. And they showed that offspring of undernourished mothers had reduced beta cell mass, which has been shown in quite a few studies. But when they gave Exendin 4 to these neonates, they restored beta cell mass and beta cell proliferation as well. And this was linked with quite marked changes in islet PDX1 promoter methylation as well. And we've done quite a bit of work on taurine. There's some hidden data back from two or three decades ago using the low protein rat model where they gave um, taurine supplements to the mothers and drinking water in the setting of low protein. And they saw that the pancreas developed completely normally in these offspring and it seemed to have permanent effects um, in these offspring. And we know that taurine concentrations are low in diabetic and pre-diabetic states. And we know that physiological plasma taurine levels are important for maintenance of beta cell function. And we know that in certain liver type disorders, um, including maternal hepatic cholestasis, that taurine can actually reverse some of these adverse effects in these individuals. And it seems to confer long-term beneficial effects in the offspring. And there's some example from one of our studies where we loaded the mothers with fructose, we saw hepatic steatosis. When we put about 1.5% taurine in drinking water, we completely restored those effects in the mother. So we, we protected the mother completely in that setting. And if you look at the markers of insulin resistance, oh, there's, there's fasting plasma insulin there, and some inflammatory markers in the um, mothers, uh, this is IL-1 beta, you can see that a fructose diet induces a pro-inflammatory phenotype and hyperinsulinemia in these mothers. You give them taurine in the drinking water, you completely resolve these effects. And importantly, you've helped the mother, and this passes on to the, fem uh, the offspring as well, both males and females. If you look at some markers, I haven't got time to show you a lot, but a range of markers, you'll see a complete restoration of some of these pro-inflammatory and insulin-type markers in the offspring at birth following maternal supplementation with taurine. We've also done some work with growth hormone. We know that offspring born to undernourished mothers are typically hypoleptinemic, hyperinsulinemic. We also know they've got very low IGF-1 levels and disturbances in the growth hormone IGF-1 axis. So using the very same critical window we used for leptin, the first two weeks of life, we treated these offspring of undernourished mothers with growth hormone. And what we saw was that they were fatter. We saw uh, increased adipocyte size. And when they were exposed to growth hormone during this critical window of plasticity, we see a complete normalization of, of adipocyte size in later life as well. And here's the basic data. You can see the offspring of undernourished mothers here are fatter than controls. And they've also got quite markedly increased systolic blood pressure as well. This is at day 150, so a mature adult. But if they were given growth hormone as neonates, we seem to have lifelong protective effects conferred on these offspring. Obviously, growth hormone as a treatment at this window is not likely to convert easily to a clinical setting. But we all know that growth hormone can actually be modified by a number of different um, avenues, the diet, exercise, sleep patterns, and so forth as well. So it just shows proof of concept that a range of quite easy um, interventions in the road it can actually have lasting beneficial effects in the life course of the offspring, whether it be maternal undernutrition or maternal obesity. And we've also done some work with conjugated linoleic acid, a maternal lipid supplementation. And if you look at the offspring, look at the homer in the sea there, you see offspring of obese mothers here have impaired insulin sensitivity. And interestingly, they've got a pro-inflammatory phenotype in their gut. And I haven't got time to go into it now, but they've also got altered gut taste receptors. Um, they seem to have a preference for um, high fat and sugary foods and altered gl glucose sensing. If we gave the mother CLA, this isoform here, in the maternal diet, we resolve these effects in the offspring. And we also see quite beneficial effects in the mother as well. We see a very similar graph here for Homer in the mother, which is quite good, because we know that obese mothers go on to have a high risk of developing type 2 diabetes later on in life themselves. And there's some interesting work from Caitlin Wirrell a few years ago now, just looking at postnatal omega-3 supplements. And they showed that offspring following a dexamethasone model were hyperleptinemic at, at uh, three months of age, I think it was. But if they're given a, a postnatal diet rich in omega-3s, we could completely prevent that um, phenotype. I haven't got time to go much into vitamin D status, but New Zealand's quite a funny setting because even though we've got a lot of sunshine, we're told to cover up all the time. So actually, our society is actually uh, reflecting a lot of vitamin D deficiency. Um, but the impact of supplements on outcomes related to adiposity are actually quite conflicting. It's one of these areas where the data's all over the place. 
But we know that pre-pregnancy obesity does predict poor vitamin D status in mothers in their neonates. We've heard a bit about dietary methyl donors today. What's actually quite interesting is a range of methyl donors supplementation, whether it's folic acid, glycine, choline, or mixed supplements, as we heard from Rob before, all have been published that show beneficial effects on long-term outcomes in the offspring, particularly cardiovascular function and blood pressure as well. And here's an example of some work we did looking at choline supplementation using a low-protein model in the rat. Once again, the offspring of low-protein-fed mothers have high blood pressure, increased fat pad weight, but when the mother was given a choline supplement in the diet, we saw a restoration of these features. We haven't looked at the methylation status of these animals yet, but we will be. Exercise lifestyle interventions. Well, we know that physical activity has the potential to mitigate against increased adiposity in the offspring that are programmed during two critical windows, maternal exercise prior to and during pregnancy, and exercise during early childhood for those deemed at risk of programmed obesity. Um, and there's also, like the report here, they do have residential programs for those kids who are really obese, but obviously that's not, have, not going to have a broad platform to roll out because of the cost implications. And a recent early feeding practices as I mentioned, study reported no change in prevalence of overweight or obesity. We have done some work in the rat using um, exercise wheels. This top line here is offspring born to undernourished mothers. Over time, they get fatter and fatter, but we expose them to relatively low levels of exercise, and we can turn them back to controls over time as well. And some work by Peter Nathaniels and his group has shown that dietary intervention in obese mothers prior to pregnancy resolves the phenotypic outcomes in the offspring. Maternal obesity here and dietary intervention here. And the effects did persist into adult life, but they were sex-specific. And although this is a great ethical debate, one of the easiest ways to prevent the phenotype in adult life is to stop them doing catch-up growth. So if you, have, if you use the model of undernutrition, you allow the offspring of undernourished mothers to catch up closer to the controls. They develop increased adiposity. If they're born small to undernourished mothers, you keep them small during this pre-weaning period. In adult life, they are completely indifferentiable from controls. So it's an easy way to prevent a phenotype developing by restricting or constraining this growth in the first few weeks of life. I'm not going to too much into the maternal obesity and omega-3 uh, DHA studies, because once again, a lot of it depends on the dose, duration, the exposure, the model used. But I draw your attention to a study we've just done in New Zealand, which got a lot of attention, and it may explain why there's so many differences across some of the studies reported. We tested about 32 supplements that are available for purchase commercially in New Zealand, and over 80% of them were either heavily oxidized or contained far lower levels of um, omega-3s than they were actually marketed. So that may explain some of the differences in some of the results people are seeing. And also, there's a lot of work being done on pre and probiotics, especially in terms of reprobing the gut flora. And early gut microbiota modulation with probiotics may modify the growth pattern of the child by restraining excessive weight gain during the first years of life. So there's been arguments towards supplementation of infant formula with oligosaccharides to compensate for the lack of some of these special substances in, that are naturally present in human milk. But the biggest take-home message from the intervention studies to date is that potential that interventions in setting of intact systems may lead to adverse outcomes. So how best do you identify those at risk of program disorders? Tailored approach, metabolic markers, we've heard some of the association studies today already. And on top of this, we've got quite profound sex-specific effects. For example, maternal methyl deficient diets can result in metabolic disturbances in male, not, not, not female rat offspring. So predictive biomarkers, which is where some of the epigenetic work is going, more and more the importance of large biobanks. And we know, for example, from some of the work that Karen and Southampton's done that core blood methylation of RxR alpha uh, links to cha later childhood adiposity. But what do you do with that data? Where do you take it? How do you implement that? You know that child may be at an increased risk of adiposity later on. And getting around causative versus associative. And on top of this, biomarkers and populations often have a wide range, and individuals within this range can have um, quite different behaviors. And in addition, what are the trade-offs? Are there short-term benefits for longer-term adverse trade-offs? We know that epi mutations that are likely to be associated with short-term trade-offs, beneficial, may have later negative health outcomes. And we've already touched on this before. A single maternal insult has two generations of effects. So we've got to consider developmental programming as a transgenerational phenomenon, 
Most studies that have gone to F3 and beyond, which is truly transgenerational, have shown in many cases that the, that the phenotype is actually resolved, but more work has to be done on that. A lot of only studies only go to F2 at the moment, which is not truly transgenerational, because it reflects the original insult. And we've already mentioned the dad, so I don't need to go about that. There's a lot of data now showing that it's actually the dad that's actually causing a lot of the effects, and these can be sex-specific as well. There's some nice work from Margaret Morris's group showing that the chronic high fat diet in the father programs beta cell dysfunction in female rat offspring. But they can restore this by the dad getting on an exercise bike. So the early life period of the animal plasticity offers the most effective avenue for the largest return on investment. And although reversal has been shown in a wide number of experimental models, maternal and neonatal interventions, direct translation to the clinic may prove difficult, but it will definitely inform on possible intervention strategies. So thank you very much. Sorry, I was rushed.